Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us, and welcome to another session of our 2023 educational series. Uh, the topic of today's town hall is accessible travel, and we are very excited today to welcome Candy Harrington. Well, Candy is a writer, a journalist, speaker, and co-founder of Emerging Horizons, uh, which is a travel resource for wheelchair users and slow walkers. She has thousands of accessible travel bylines to her credit and is the author of a sizable library of accessible travel titles. Um, she's also a frequent speaker about accessible travel issues and maintains her popular barrier-free travel blog at www.barrierfreetravels.com. Um, so we're thrilled to welcome her, welcome her here today. Uh, before we begin, there are a couple of housekeeping items I want to get out of the way. So we will begin with a short presentation, uh, after which we will open it up for questions. You can either type your questions by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, or you may use the uh, raise hand feature, and we will try to call on you in the order that you raise your hand. So then we'll just open up your mic and you can ask it live. Uh, we will be recording today's session. Uh, the recording will be available probably later in the, in the week. Uh, you can view it either on our website or on our YouTube or Facebook pages. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to today's presenter, Candy Harrington. There you go. Well, I have been writing about accessible travel for nearly 30 years. And one of the things that I really try to emphasize in all of my writings and talking to people is about travel planning. Three things that you really want to do. You want to know your rights, you want to do your research, and you want to utilize your research, your resources. And I am the total resource gal. So I have a bunch of resources I'd like to share with you before I open it up for questions. And a lot of these resources are very long URLs. So I have them all, emerginghorizons.com slash postpolio. So you don't have to write about, or worry about writing down any URLs or anything, just emerginghorizons.com slash postpolio, and they'll all be there. And this, if you don't have a pen right now, this is also going to be the last slide. So let's talk a little bit about air travel. It's something that I get absolutely the most questions about. And in the US, air travel is covered by the Air Carrier Access Act, not the ADA. And it's a very, very approachable law. That's the very first resource up there. And I encourage you to go and read it. It's very easy. It's in Q&A format. It's not a lot of legalese or anything. They'll give you a really good idea of what to expect when you get on an airplane. And the second resource I have, timeline for implementation of accessible laboratories on single aisle aircraft. That's quite a mouthful there. It's an article I've written. Currently, uh, you don't have to have accessible laboratories on single aisle aircraft, only on wide bodies. That's changing. And this is kind of a timeline of when to expect that change. And the last one down there, I've also written an article about disabled travelers, air travelers bill of rights. Again, it'll give you a really good idea what your rights are and what to expect when you get on the airplane. More air travel resources, the DOT, they have some great accessible travel brochures. I encourage you to go and have a look at them. They also have a hotline for air travelers with a disability. They call it a hotline. It's more of a warm line because it's like Monday through Friday, nine to five, and they're in Washington, DC. This is a place to call, not if you're having problems, but if you have questions about the law, about the Air Carriers Access Act, if you wanna know what to expect when you get to the airport. And finally, if things don't go as planned on your flight, you can file a complaint with the DOT. I encourage you to do this. You might not get anything personally out of it, but it does help to make air travel more accessible. 
The Transportation Security Administration also has some resources. These are the folks that screen you at airports. They are a government agency, so they are not bound under the ADA or any other guidelines, but they do have their own guidelines for screening people with disabilities. And I encourage you to look at this. It's very well done. It will give you an idea of what your security screening is going to go like. They also have a hotline, a warm line. They ask that you call 72 hours in advance. This is a place to ask questions like, can I take this through security? I have some medicines that need to be refrigerated. I have oxygen, what am I gonna do? And this is a really good resource because not only will they answer your questions, but in many cases, they'll get somebody to the airport that you're going to, to assist you. And if you don't want to call them, they also have a form you can fill out. And last down there is TSA PreCheck. This is the thing that gets you fast tracked through the security line. You don't have to take your coat off. You don't have to take your shoes off. You don't have to take your laptop out. It might be a good resource for some slow walkers. It'll streamline the process. That said, if you're in a wheelchair, that wheelchair can't go through the metal detector and it's going to have to be swabbed. So it's still going to take you a little bit of extra time. So let's talk a little bit about lodging. Lodging is covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Unlike the Air Carrier Access Act, it's not as easy to read because it is pretty much filled with government legalese and such, but you can get into it. You'll have a pretty good idea of what to expect in hotels in the US. I will tell you two things about the ADA. First, properties with fewer than 50 rooms do not have to have accessible rooms with roll-in showers. They only have to have accessible rooms with tub shower combinations. So if you absolutely need an accessible room, look for that larger property. Second, in the US, they are required to block accessible rooms upon reservation. Basically, this means they set aside a specific room for a specific person on a specific day. It's not the same as guaranteeing. Guaranteeing only means that they're guaranteeing the price. So you want to make sure they block the room when you make your reservation. Now, if you run into any problems with hotels, you can also file an ADA complaint with the Department of Justice, and I have the link down for that. Cruises, cruises are a great option for anybody with a disability. You only have to unpack once, you can see a lot of ports, and with more and more ports available, a lot of times you can actually drive to the port. Now, technically the cruises are not covered under the ADA in that they don't have any guidelines like they have for the hotels. But I will tell you that the large ships have excellent access, especially the large lines, the ships built within the last couple of three years. And my best advice for you for planning a cruise is to shop around for accessible shore excursions first and then decide which cruise you're going to go on. And Cruise Critic here, it's an excellent resource. They have people that like to cruise. They have a disabled cruise travel forum, and they'll answer your questions. Um, there's nothing better than first person advice. So if you're gonna cruise, check out Cruise Critic. Now let's talk a little bit about road trips. I absolutely love road trips. You can take them at your own pace. You can pack along anything you want. And first and foremost, you don't have to worry about the airline damaging or losing your wheelchair. I do have some resources for road trips. Emergency road service, absolutely essential for any road trip. I think it's essential just for driving around town, but most road service, roadside assistance, they do not have accessible vehicles. Mobility roadside assistance does. Also, if you're going on a road trip you, and you do have uh, some special equipment in your van, you want to know where you can get it serviced along the way. The National Mobility Equipment Dealers Association is a good resource for that. They have a nice database on there. Now, I'm a huge fan of national parks. 
I've written a guide, a free access guide here about enjoying your national parks for wheelchair users and slow walkers. And if you do decide to go to a national park, you're absolutely going to want to get America the Beautiful Access Pass. This will give you free entrance into all national parks and national monuments. It's a lifetime pass. It's available to anyone with a permanent disability that lives in the US. Handicap Travel Cup. I get a lot of questions about accessible RVs. These are the people to go to. They're a group of people that travel around together. They have, they go to rallies. They have an excellent website. Everything you want to know about buying an accessible RV, converting it, how to travel. Now, if you want to actually rent an accessible RV, this is a new resource. It's the Winnebago Roam. It's a project between Brownability and United Access. It is only available in Denver, but it is an accessible RV. It's about the size of an Amazon, large Amazon van. It's really cool. It's it's got all you know these automated features. It's got a bed that you a remote control bed that folds out. I haven't seen it yet. I've seen photos, but I do get to see it in a couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to that. And finally, if you're going to take a road trip, the FIA parking guide will give you information about different parking regulations in different states. Your placard is usable in all the states. The only exception is a few private lots in New York City. So I, I encourage you to look at that. Some general accessible travel resources. How much training does your travel agent really have? It's an article I've written. There's no real standard for training. Travel agents have different amounts of training. And I've kind of told you in this article what to look for and what kind of training they can have. The Pantau database, that's one of my favorite databases for accessible travel providers. It's especially good for Europe and the Far East. They have accessible transportation, hotels, and tours. And finally, down at the bottom, the Accessible Travel Club on Facebook. This is a great resource. I'm really big on first-person information, first-hand information. They have over 16,000 members there. And the great thing about it is that some of these members actually live in a place where you're going to, so they can give you some really good first-hand information. Last resource, sometimes depending on the day, I can be a good resource. Here is all of my information. And as promised, this is where all of my resources live. So if you, you know, don't have to write them down, again, emerginghorizons.com slash postfolio. So I guess if you want to take questions now, we can do that. Yeah, thank you, Candy. Those are some uh, really great resources and a few. Uh, weren't able to jot them down. Don't worry. We are recording this video and uh, we can also include those. Uh, we can include some hyperlinks in an email we send out uh, after the talk. Um, all right. So uh, Mickey Minner asks uh, regarding lodging. She says, do you recommend calling the property after making an online reservation for a, a handicapped room or an accessible room? Absolutely, I do. Uh, Sometimes, now some reservation systems are better than others, uh, but it always helps to call the property directly to make sure and ask them if that room is blocked, not just guaranteed, or you don't want the, well, we'll give it to you if it's available when we get there, because that's really not going to help you. You want to make sure that it's blocked, and a good way to do that is by calling the property directly. I also do recommend maybe calling between like noon and three their time because they're super busy in the morning with checkouts. All right. Uh, she also had another comment she followed up with, um, noting that the ship's line does not necessarily mean that excursions they sponsor know if the excursion is accessible. Um, I'm not sure what the okay. question is. Okay. Um, uh, but let me let me just follow up on that. Okay. Uh, the cruise lines they do most of the major cruise lines do have a special needs department, 
and they can help you with ship-sponsored shore excursions. That said, if you wait till all the way at the end when the special needs department will work with you, you might not be able to get on the accessible shore excursions. They could be sold out because the supplier is not just selling to the ship, they're selling to a lot of ships, they're selling to individual people. So if you can get, uh, you know, book your own accessible shore excursions, you can actually do that a lot further in advance and you'll have a lot better chance at getting what you want. All right, uh, Rhoda Olkin asks, uh, what do you know about Viking cruises? <laughs> oh, um, I always get asked that. Um, not a good choice for wheelchair users and slow walkers. They're, uh, they're one of the lines that really even discourages wheelchairs. River cruises are difficult at best because when you dock, when you dock a regular ship, you know, the gangway comes down and everybody gets off. When you dock a river cruise, it depends on when you're there. And sometimes it can be two or three ships in from the dock and you have to climb up and over and up and over. So it not only depends on your ship, it also depends on the other two or three ships that you might have to pass through in regards to access. But um, no, I, I don't recommend Viking. <laughs> I don't know how much more I can say about that, but that's pretty much it. Okay. Um, I see Maureen has her hand raised. Maureen, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Nice to see you again, Candy. I know we've spoken a couple of times. I've been putting together cruises for the past 19 years for mo mm -hmm. mainly polio survivors. Ah. And I have found that um, the so-called accessible tours, uh, you know, most of us have gone to power wheelchairs and we're not in anything that comes apart and folds and stows and that sort of thing. And unless you have that type of uh, transportation, um, they don't take you. And if they don't get enough people on their tours, um, they can't. They just cancel it. And I have been very successful in finding my own uh, private tours because we have enough people to fill, you know, a vehicle or two. And um, anyway, so that's what I have found that you know is helpful. You know, you can just Google it. You know, accessible transportation, Dominican Republic, or whatever. And if it's there, it's there. And, and yes, Cruise Critic is a uh, is a big help as well. So thank you. I, I'm I'm gonna steal a couple of your tips in there too. <laughs> well, no, and, and it is really accessible transportation is absolutely on a cruise the number one thing. Actually, it's the number one thing you need when you travel anywhere because if you don't have accessible transportation and you are in a wheelchair, oh, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Exactly. Let's see if I can. All right. Thank you, Maureen. Okay. Let's see. We've, we had one in the chat here. Um, Linda asked, what is the best way to get luggage from the parking garage to the airport and getting to the car rental at the airport with luggage? Well, it depends on the airport, really. If you're talking parking garage, sometimes they are separate from the actual terminal and you have to take a shuttle to even get to the terminal. I would say to call the airline, it's also airline specific, and tell them that you have, uh, you're going to need wheelchair assistance and that's assistance with your luggage. You're supposed to get it. It's under the Americans with Disabilities Act they can figure out how they're going to help you, but they have to get you from the curb with your luggage to the door of the aircraft. I also recommend that if you can get the local number for the airport, for the airline, so you can call their desk if you show up at the airport and there's nobody to meet you. Um, that's worked out for a lot of people. Sometimes it's hard to get that local number, but having it in your cell phone so you can just hit send or dial uh, when you really need some help is something good. All right. 
Um, here's a question from Richard. Yes, are there particular cruise lines uh, and or particular parts of the world that tend to have greater numbers of accessible shore excursions? Well, I would say for cruise lines, um, the number one uh, accessible shore excursions absolutely are for an Alaska cruise. You're still in the US, they're bound under the ADA. Um, there's accessible transportation up there. Um, I will say, yeah, that's that's the number one. If, if you want the absolute number one, the Caribbean is difficult. Um, it's doable. It takes a lot of phone calls. And again, accessible transportation is in short supply in the Caribbean. Um, and sometimes if they have an accessible vehicle and it breaks down, they don't have the parts to fix it. So they have to wait for parts from probably China. I don't know. Um, and it, so it's more difficult in the Caribbean. But yeah, Alaska, you, you'll have a great experience. And in, in several of the ports, you can do things right in the port, like the Lumberjack Show is right in the port, um, you know, so you don't even have to worry about accessible transportation. Okay, great. Let's see. Um, I'm going to answer this one from Bruce. Uh, he says, I'm six feet, six inches tall. My legs ache when sitting for a long time. Are there special accommodations for more leg room without paying an arm and a leg from the airlines? Um, well, yes and no. The law says, I'll tell you what the law says, that um, people in wheelchairs are not really entitled to bulkhead seats and they're not entitled to upgrades or anything like that. That said, it depends on the airline. And sometimes I've known people that have been able to get into an economy plus seat, not first class, to get into a seat that better fits them by talking to the airlines on the phone first before um, you get to the airport and explaining your, your problem. And you can say, well, it's a disability related because it probably is. I mean, you know, well, you're six, six, but you know, you, you, you get what you get when, you know, um, so I would I would ask them that and then just be really nice to the gate agents. The gate agents are wonderful. They can do just about anything they want to. So, you know, if you go up there and oh, you know, please, please, and oh, here's here's a candy bar for you. That that works. That that really does work. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not above bribing people. <laughs> If, uh, there's a, a few questions in here, I think, asking just generally about uh, experience with train travel in the U.S. and particularly Amtrak. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, Amtrak has done, now they're redesigning their trains again, but they have done a really good job. Um, now, I will say most stations, most all stations either have level boarding or they do have lifts. Um, I, lo I love Amtrak because they have the old fashioned crank lifts, not that I'm anti, you know, electricity or anything, but the new ones with the batteries and the power, if something goes wrong with them, they can't get them to work, you can always crank the lift. Um, they have cars with accessible, really accessible restrooms in them, they're huge. Uh, they have, they will bring you, if you're in coach, they'll bring you food. You don't have to go to the dining car. They're, they're very helpful. They do have some accessible overnight sleeping areas. Um, they're a little tight, but you, you can get in. I mean, you're not going to have a, a group of people in there, but they're doable. Uh, they are redoing their accessible cars. So I am looking for better accessibility in the future, but I, I love what they've done so far and you know, look forward to seeing what they're gonna add to it. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Um, this is a, and I got the, I've gotten some questions in the past about this, um, about travelers that use a, uh, portable ventilator. 
Um, someone asked, where would you go in the U.S. if your oxygen concentrator or BiPAP machine broke in the midst of travel? Or are there good resources out there for, for traveling with a ventilator? Well, the first, uh, to answer the first question, uh, this is something, and I always call it, you know, be prepared. I, my thing is ask a lot of what if questions before you go. I mean, not to worry yourself to death or anything, but just to be prepared. And one of those questions, if you're traveling with a, a ventilator, um, is what do I do if it breaks? So in that case, I would contact the manufacturer and then find out, find a place in your destination that is able to service and repair the ventilator and of course carry that information with you. So if something goes wrong, you don't have to you know, panic as you've got it there. I, I also suggest this for wheelchairs to find somebody in your destination city that's capable of repairing your wheelchair um, and have that information with you. Um, as far as ventilator travel resources, I haven't really seen a lot of them. I I do, you know, look on that Facebook, uh, Facebook, Facebook page on accessible travel because they have a little bit of everything there, and they can usually. I've, you know, I've not seen a question that somebody isn't able to give a resource to or an answer to. All right. The. Um, Ken asked, is there a difference uh, between uh, how scooters and wheelchairs are treated under the ADA? Um, I guess he's talking about the airline, the Air Carrier Access yeah. Act. Um, no, uh, I mean, scooters are treated at the same as wheelchairs. There are a few exceptions here. Uh, if you have a non-spillable battery, there's no problem with your wheelchair. Um, you can gate check it, which means you can go all the way to the gate and uh, you know sit in it until you wait for the airplane. Um, if you don't have a non-spillable battery, it has to be checked in at the lug with the luggage. Now, if you have a lithium-ion battery, there are some scooters that now have lithium-ion batteries. There is it, it's it's airline dependent. They're not the airlines are not required to transport um, scooters with the lithium ion batteries, but they are allowed to um, by the FAA now. And the, some airlines do, and some airlines don't. And I will tell you, they all have different you know directions on what you need to do before you travel. So I would look to, if you have a lithium ion battery scooter, uh, I definitely look at the airline websites and find out who's going to take you, who's not, and what you have to do before you get to the airport. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, there's a, just a couple questions. I'll kind of lump them together here. Um, asking about national parks um, and, you know, and, special access for people with disabilities. Um, and then one specifically asking, so if you had like a rented car and you didn't have uh, accessible plates on your car, what might you do in that situation? Or is it just a pass or, or what is what form does the pass come in? Okay, well the pass actually, we're talking, well, first of all, if you do have, if you're going to rent a car, I'll always take your your hang tag, your accessible hang tag with you, because you can use that on any on any vehicle. Uh, the the pass I'm talking about, it looks like a little credit card. It is a pass that you carry with you in your wallet, uh, has your name on it. They usually ask for your driver's license to make sure that you're the same person. And you can just hand it to whoever is at the attendant at the gate and you'll get in free. And everybody in your car is free too. Uh, so it's more of a, a pass that you like carry in your wallet, not hang on your car. All right. Um, let's see. Francine, are you there? You had a longer question. I didn't know if you want to just uh, open up your mic. Yeah, 
Yeah, there. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to comment that my experience on Amtrak has not been good. That um, you know, on a short trip I took of about five hours or so, um, and I've traveled quite a bit, um, uh, the personnel at both ends, at both stations, had no idea about where the accessible seating was on the long train. And uh, on the way down to Fresno, we finally found uh, ex an accessible spot for me and that worked out fine. But the bathroom was not, it was locked. And when they opened it up, it turned out that the door wasn't working so you couldn't close the door. And it was right where people were going up and down the stairs in order to access the top part. And on the way back, there was no accessible seating available. And I had reserved disabled person seating for myself and then my husband as a companion. And there was nothing on the way back. Um, it was pretty terrible. <laughs> and uh, my experience with trains in the UK is that they are great. They rush to help you and um, they'll put a ramp down even if you hadn't reserved disabled seating. They have places to hook your wheelchair or your scooter um, to the wall so that it doesn't roll around. And there's lots of room in the seating. So my experience with Amtrak has not been good, but with uh, trains in the UK and Ireland, it's been excellent. So it may just vary, you know, which particular routes you take with Amtrak, but I don't think I would take Amtrak again <laughs> after the experience. Yeah, I'm I kind of familiar with the route you took. I used to live in California and, um, you can go either way on that route. I, I can see it, you know, the employees not maybe not caring and not knowing, um, you know, I can even see somebody probably using an accessible bathroom for storage, uh, not the way it's supposed to work. And I, if, if it happens again, I, I, or something like that happens, I would file a complaint with the Department of Transportation. Yeah, I probably should have done that. My thought was just, well, I don't think I'm gonna do this again anyway. Uh, yeah, and you know what? So, the, um, I'd rather drive than do that. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I get it. Yeah, um, but uh, you are right, though. The the trains in the UK, um, they're not only do they actually run on time, um, but they're very conscious about um, people in wheelchairs, and they they do help, and they don't just sit around and wait you to say hey I, I need help here <laughs> yeah, really really they rush to help you they're watching yeah. out for you and what my experience here was I it was difficult to even find any personnel at the station so anyway yeah. that's it I'm sorry to go on so long not at all all right I see Sharon has her hand raised Sharon go ahead Hi, I emailed you a question, but I didn't know if you were going to look at those. I'm just curious, um, can, uh, Candy, have you had anybody go on an African safari? The last one of these we had, um, someone mentioned that there was an accessible safari. And I was just wondering about that. I've always wanted to go to Africa. Actually, there is. Um, and there are, it depends on what, what we're in Africa, Africa, huge country or a huge continent. Um, in, in Kenya, in Botswana, in South Africa, they do have companies that operate there. They are also, um, they have accessible and really accessible, meaning that they have a lift and you will get on the safari vehicle that way. Uh, Mala Mala Game Preserve, uh, they have their own accessible vehicle and actually a beautiful accessible tent suite i mean they're all tents but they're but they're nice tents um and, and they have accessible bathrooms and plumbing in them and um yeah there are several options and i just saw somebody again i'm talking about it on the facebook page uh for accessible travel um you can go in there and search they've this subject has been gone over or you could just outright ask a question there but there are several providers that do that. So, and I, I've known people, I don't know what your situation is, but I have known people in power wheelchairs that have gone on African safaris. So 
Could you list those countries? Could you list those countries again? Kenya, um, Botswana. Kenya, Botswana, and and South Africa. Okay, not Tanzania. Um, there was a company that was doing it in Tanzania. I'm not sure if they're still operating. Uh, sometimes these companies sort of change borders uh, when <laughs> things are not really doing well in one province or one state they they go to another country mm -hmm. um, but it, you know it, it's uh because they want everybody to be safe um so yeah but i i do look at the accessible travel facebook page because it's been discussed there um okay. resources thank you go you can go yes absolutely <laughs> All right, uh, Robert, are you there? Robert? Oops. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Con concerning Francine's experience going to Fresno, that was not a, a cross-country train where you would stay on the train overnight. And I, I agree, she probably did have problems. But if you take a cross country train, for instance, the Zephyr, basically from Oakland, California to Chicago, it's an overnight train and they do have uh, uh, better accommodations for, um, for a handicap. Now, I'm not in a wheelchair, so uh, I can't uh, speak to that, but I do know that uh, 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 they have uh, handicap rooms on the lower level. They will bring your meals to you. Um, and also the lower level of the coaches, you can reserve uh, a seat there on the lower level of the coaches uh, for handicap. So for what it's worth, uh, cross country travel is better than local travel, I think on Amtrak. Yeah, you brought up a good point there that uh, because some of the local trains, they don't even have sleeping cars. No, um, no, they, yeah, correct. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I enjoy train travel uh, more than I thought I would. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, it depends. But I, like I said, I, I've been on that route and, and to that station and, and I can see some issues too. Um, here's a question in the chat. They're asking um, uh, regarding travel in Europe, um, places to avoid, places you'd recommend? Places to avoid. Uh, let's go with places to recommend. Um, okay. Well, you know, it, the, the UK, okay, I love London because all of the London black taxis are accessible. Uh, so you can even roll your scooter into them. Uh, Barcelona, a lot of Spain is, it, they've done really great with access. Um, Italy, um, you know, it's, there is accessible transportation there. It takes a while to find, you have to plan in advance, but I've known a lot of people that have done it. Um, Greece, it's a little harder too. Um, you got the cobblestones. That's that's always a challenge in a wheelchair. And even if you're a slow walker, it's a challenge because they're a tripping hazard. Um, and you don't want to end up in a wheelchair if you're a slow walker. Um, so um, yeah, that's pretty much, uh, you know, Europe has done a pretty good job um, of accessing. They have a kind of a matter of fact attitude about, well, you're in a wheelchair, we're gonna make it accessible for you. So. All right, I see Sandy has her raised her hand raised. Go ahead, Sandy. Well, actually I just sent it in the in the chat, but I'll <clears throat> excuse ahead. me, I'll tell you. I was wanted to agree with Robert because I've not taken local trains, but I just came back from the Texas Eagle from California to San Antonio. And then a couple of short hops up to Oklahoma, they weren't as good, but then a, um, a long overnight back from Oklahoma back to California on the Southwest Chief, and they couldn't have been more accommodating. I mean, they met me at the gate with the red cap, took me to the stations, 
because I couldn't walk that far. I mean, it was, it, they were wonderful. So I don't know. I, I think maybe the o- overnight trains are, are great, but the short hops from, from Texas to Oklahoma, not as good. I have to admit, you know, they, they were a little bit more difficult. I am going to be taking the one that goes up the coast of California from oh. Southern California to Monterey here pretty soon. And I'm hoping that, th- that that's going to be enjoyable as well, but I just want to very ni- I've been on that route. It's very nice. Um, the one thing I want to tell you is um, on that route, well, on all, all routes, um, the freight has, you know, the priority over Amtrak. So if there's a freight oh, train, yeah. they, they need to, the, the California um, Starlight route, it, at plan extra time like don't don't tell somebody to pick you up at an exact time <laughs> i've been like you know like nine hours late so but but the, the scenery is beautiful so it's it's worth it um right. and you also brought up an, an another point too is with the overnight train or the longer trains uh, a lot of the employees the newer employees are working the local routes and you have to work your way up because working on an overnight train is better. I, they like it better. I don't know. It's it's a upgrade for them. And so you're going to get the more experienced employees, the employees that really want to show the customer service too. So that's with the longer trains. That's also right. right. Thank you. All right. Uh, Richard Nelson. Richard, are you there? Yeah. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, if you take Amtrak, uh, say cross country, and you get to the station, do they have rental cars available there, or n- not like an airport uh, where you f- reserve a car, no. and go and pick it up? Can you do that with Amtrak? No, they. Okay. Generally speaking, they don't. Sometimes you will have an Amtrak station close to something else that will have um, rental cars. But generally speaking, Amtrak stations um, don't have rental cars. Um, I would see, I don't know if you're traveling alone, but I would see if there's one in the city, not an airport location, but a city and perhaps you can get, like if you're going to Chicago, uh, they do have a lot of accessible taxis to get an accessible taxi over to the city location, uh, not the airport location. Most most of them, most rental car agencies have a city location too. So that's that's probably what I would try to do. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this is more uh, of a personal question for you, but someone asked, um, what trip did you have taken has been your favorite and why? Ooh, tough question. Um, I probably to New Zealand. I've been to New Zealand twice. I love it. Uh, it's very accessible. The people are friendly. They are very common sense about access. It's like, um, it, it and it's a beautiful country. I lived in Australia for two years, and I never made it to New Zealand, uh, even though it's just a, a little stone's throw away. But I have made up for it since, and um, we've just we've been to both islands, the north and south, and my husband and I absolutely love it. We even took a motor home, <laughs> uh, and drove a motor home around New Zealand, and although it was a good experience, um, I don't think I'd do it again because it's um, a lot of packing and unpacking. I think you're either a motor home person or you're not but they have campgrounds there that have little cabins in them and the cabins, most of the cabins are accessible. So that's that's an option if you want to kind of do an outdoors-ish thing and don't want to take the RV. All right, thank you. Let's see, Mickey asks, um, do you have any experience with viewing or observation trains in Alaska and Canada? They, well, yeah, in both. Um, the um, the Canadian one runs from um, not sure where it, it's it runs it, through Alberta. I should know this. I live like I'm almost Canada here. This is I don't even know my provinces. Um, and it they have a, a domed viewing car, which I think is what you're talking about, and they do have lift access to it. 
you have to go down the lift and eat in because they give you all the meals on the the journey you do have to go down and eat downstairs but it's kind of um very special it, it, it's nice and fancy and a, a very nice dining experience in alaska <clears throat> they also do have the lifts and all the cruise lines um, do provide, they call them whatever, land shore tours. So you can add on to your cruise and you can take a, a, a vacation and you can get on the train and do it. And most of the cruise lines actually have their own rail cars and they do have lifts at, but if you wanna do it as a regular passenger without the cruise line, they also have cars with lifts and they have lifts at the station. See, here is a question just came in by email. They ask, what is the biggest thing that people with accessibility needs overlook when planning overseas travel? Um, I think if you're um, dealing with an assistive device, a power wheelchair or a scooter, uh, it's probably electricity. You need a converter. Uh, there are two things. There's a converter and there's an adapter. An adapter is going to fit on your charger to plug into the wall. So you can actually, you know, we have, you know, two little prongs. They have three over there, a lot of places. So uh, my thing is just because you can plug it into the wall doesn't mean it's safe because if you don't have a converter, now some wheelchairs do have them already installed but you need to kind of educate yourself about what your wheelchair has. Um, otherwise you'll fry your wheelchair um, and you won't be able to go anywhere. So I, I would think that would be my number one. All right, great. Um, and then another question, this one from uh, Judy, she asked, um, what advice would you have uh, for people that are reluctant to travel? because of accessibility issues. Obviously. Right, right. Um, well, I say if you're reluctant to travel, um, you know, the fear of the unknown is is absolutely normal. So I would say plan your first trip, like plan a road trip, plan it close to home so that if things really go south and you hate it, you can come back. It's kind of like having a little safety net there. And, and you might have to do this a couple of times and, and you know, get used to checking into a hotel to see what the different features are and stuff. But, you know, you don't have to make, don't make your first trip the, you know, the 15 day tour of Europe. Um, let's, let's start a little smaller first and get used to it. All right, um, let's see. Joan asks, are river cruise ships required to let you bring a walker or wheelchair into your room on the ship and or and just not just store them, I guess? Okay, on most cruise ships, uh, they don't want um, walkers or wheelchairs or any devices uh, stored in the hallway because it is a safety issue. It's a Coast Guard issue that if they were to have to evacuate the ship, that the, these would be in the way. The problem is that the accessible cabins on these ships are usually the only ones that have wide doorways um, that can accommodate most wheelchairs. And I know there's some, some teeny tiny scooters now that will go into a standard cruise ship doorway, but they're you know much smaller. So if you do, have an assistive device, you're going to have to store it in your room and you're going to have to be able to get it in your room too. So um, you, you do need usually an accessible room for that. All right, thank you. Um, and then Ken asks, what, what about a wheelchair with lithium ion batteries? Are airlines required to transport them? Yeah, I think I, I, I Covered that a little earlier. No, they're not. They're they're allowed to. The FAA has allowed them to, but they're not required to. It's just like oxygen. So you do have to check with the individual airlines. All right, and then I'll just take a couple more here, and I, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, oh, there's another one from Ken. He asks if you are renting a car. Um, can one get one with hand controls? 
Oh, absolutely. I think it's 48 hours notice. Uh, and you can do this on the website. All of the major car rental sites have it all set up where you can just, uh, you know, select you need hand controls or you need any other or a spinner knob or whatever. Uh, so absolutely, but you need 48 hours notice. What other instructions? All right. Uh, did anyone ha uh, have a uh, question they wanted to ask live? Go ahead and, and raise your hand. All right. Well, I think, oh, go ahead, Sharon. Unmuted. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> Andy, I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed this and you've done such a wonderful job. But I do want to ask you a personal question and you don't have to answer it. Are oh, you a, are you a wheelchair or crutcher user? I am not. And you're going to okay. ask me why I cover this, right? No, <laughs> but, I didn't. Um, I was covering um, mainstream travel for about 20 years, and I got really, really bored with it because it was just fluff. So I wanted uh -huh. some meat into it. And I, um, I didn't know, I didn't even know anybody in a wheelchair at that point, but I was a journalist and I could research things. And well, that was 27 years ago. And well, I've learned a lot. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. All right. I think we'll do uh, one last question here. Uh, Marilyn asks, is there an effort to make uh, accessible hotel rooms have uh, automatic doors? Some hotels have wonderfully accessible rooms, but you can't get in or out of the room without assistance. Yeah. Um there really isn't an effort. They do have, they're not required and to have um, automatic doors, but they are required to have a certain weight pull on them. Like, you know, evil, you've had those doors that you just can't hardly open. Um, so there is a requirement that they can be openable. And I don't really recall offhand what the weight limit is, but it's so a person can actually open it. <laughs> All right, let's take one last one from Judy here. Judy, go ahead. Oops. I think you're on mute, Judy. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna still ask about the ADA travel, I did not know. Every time we go to a state um, a state park, we have, we have to pay to get in and out. And I'm I'm wondering where I get that little credit card that I carry in my bill folder. How do I get that? Well, this is this, this is actually for national parks and national monuments. Uh, however, um, uh, what state do you live in? Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, okay. Um, some states, and I don't know if Nebraska is one of them or not. Anyway, either the um, the one for the national parks, you can get at any national park entrance. You basically need proof of disability, which if you show up in a wheelchair, they're they're going to accept that. If you know you look able bodied, they might ask you for some other um, you know social security or some proof of disability. Um, and you need your driver's license. And that's about it at any um, national park entrance. I do have a link to it on um, on the resources. So you can, you can also order them by mail, but it costs $10 um, for handling. And so, you know, why not get it for free at the entrance? Well, that's true. And, and one last question. My husband's bucket list, we were married 50 years this week. And it's on his bucket list to go to Alaska. And I'm in a wheelchair. And so I've been petrified of that. So after listening to you today, I think there might be hope that I might be able to go. Oh, absolutely. Question mark? Yes, yes. I mean, you know, uh, it, and I have a lot of stuff on emerging horizons of hotels and stuff that, because I've, I've traveled pretty extensively in Alaska. I like it. 
I think they've done a good job of access. And again, if you want to add a cruise and then you can do a land excursion too. Um, I, I think it's totally possible. So what, when would I go that it's not pouring down rain? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> Um, probably your shoulder seasons and, and you're not going to have to, you're also going to have to worry about snow because it is Alaska. So your shoulder seasons are May and September, but unfortunately that's also when you have the best prices. So the summertime, June, July, and August, I, I, I won't guarantee no rain, but you know, um, it's, it's your better shot. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Judy. All right. Well, I think we are just about out of time for today. Uh, I thank Candy once again for graciously volunteering her time and wisdom, and also to all of you for joining us today. Um, again, I'd like to thank the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation for their generous sponsorship of our town hall and lecture series. Um, if you'd like to support PHI and programs such as this, you can go to PHI's website, uh, post-polio.org and click on the donate button at the top of the screen. Um, so uh, thank you everyone once again for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.